During manufacture from the raw materials, glass becomes molten and flows like syrup, getting stiffer continuously as it cools. Upon these facts depend the whole practice of the craftsman and technician in glassmaking. In the case of the craftsman, the making of glass demonstrates what a wonderful thing the human hand can be, flexible, strong, and extremely sensitive. The air bubble is the foundation on which most of the craftsman's work is based. Although machinery plays a big part these days, the craftsman, using his simple traditional tools, is still indispensable for the manufacture of special orders, too small perhaps to warrant the setting up of expensive machinery. The craftsman is also the source of most of the beautiful in glass. Beauty in glass is best expressed in lovely forms. However, simplicity in decoration can add considerably to its charm. The great beauty of glass is its translucence and color. Decoration can be obtained by cutting, etching, sandblasting, and by the mixing of these methods.
The craftsman can change quickly from one task to another, requiring only his few tools and a wealth of experience. The white section of this lump of molten glass must be in exactly the right place, as it is to be the opaque backing in the hundred feet of thermometer tubing these men will draw by hand. And the small air bubble must also be in the right position, as it becomes the passage in the thermometer. When the mass of molten glass is placed on the post, or rod, the join is made firm by cooling it rapidly with cold water. As the tubing is drawn out, it is revolved on the instructions of the craftsman. This revolving is necessary to prevent the weight of the tube causing the lump to sag out of the tube. The longer the tube gets, the more often they have to turn it over. It's really quite simple. Just a lump of molten glass, an iron tube, an iron rod, and about 10 years training. Here is another side of the industry which does not change, the craft of the pot maker. The pots made of a special clay have to be able to stand a furnace heat of 1500 degrees centigrade. The body of the pot must be uniform and well knitted and the inner surface perfectly smooth. Any irregularity would eventually break off under the drag of the glass and spoil it. The mixture of sand, soda and lime from which plate glass is made is heated in furnaces to a tremendous temperature until the raw materials in the pots slowly fuse and become ready to pour. It seems incredible that these clay pots brought to a white heat can hold safely well over a ton of molten glass while being transported and tilted in the process. has become a sheet of plate glass and goes into the cooling chamber. The process is carried out under scientific control developed through years of unremitting research. This is only one of the many problems glass researchmen have overcome. In the Department of Glass Technology at Sheffield University, Britain possesses a splendid research foundation supported by British and Dominion glass manufacturers and the university authorities. The originator of the department, which was the pioneer of its kind in the world, is Professor Turner, to whom tribute is paid by glassmakers all over the world. Students come here from many countries. In these well-equipped laboratories, the problems of glass are studied scientifically, and the results quickly conveyed to manufacturers through visits of Professor Turner and his staff, and through the Society of Glass Technology, a pioneer body with membership throughout the world. Here, a specially heat-treated safety glass windscreen is being tested. First, a bending test for pliability. Then the safety glass is tested for resistance to smashing by dropping a metal ball on it from a height of eight feet. This it easily withstands. The height is increased until the ball, dropping from 12 feet, smashes the glass which then collapses into harmless, many-sided grains having no cutting edges at all. Britain manufactures glass jars and bottles on a very large scale. Here we see a pressure test on bottles sent in by the manufacturers. Products are regularly tested at the works. The laboratories at Sheffield make control tests and report back to the manufacturers. The purity of the raw materials is also carefully checked by chemical analysis. Sand must be tested to ensure that it can be made suitable for the manufacture of fine glass. Britain has many deposits of sand, one of them as pure as any in Europe. She is the first country in the world to have carried out the purification of sand on a large scale by chemical washing.
continuous rolling process, the sand, lime and soda ash, after careful mixing, are fed into the giant tank furnace. The train man rings a bell to warn the engineers controlling the flow of molten glass of the impending disturbance and rise in level when the raw materials are fed in. The raw materials, three tons of them, pour down from the hopper, filling up the mouth of the tank. continuous rolling of plate glass is a modern miracle. The molten glass flows into the rollers and is drawn between them at the rate of about a yard a minute. Still in a semi-molten state, the glass, now recognizable as red-hot plate glass, is carried on through other rolls into the annealing chamber, several hundred feet in length, where its cooling rate is controlled so that it sets without cracking or splintering. On emerging from the annealing chamber, cold and firm, it is cut by hand to the required length. A diamond point is used. As the cut in the glass plate passes over a special roller, leverage is applied to it by rotating the roller and the plate is neatly severed through. The section of plate glass is then seized by a pneumatic grab which uses suction pads. These adhere firmly to the surface of the glass and carry a glass plate weighing anything up to half a ton quite safely. In this instance, it is carried to the grinding and polishing line. The plate glass is lowered, slowly and carefully, onto a moving belt, to which it is secured by pegs and wedges, and is then passed under the grinders. A mixture of sand and water is flooded onto the glass under the flat teeth of the grinder heads, which grind away the irregularities. Then it passes on to the polishers, which circle and swing like a circus sideshow, buffing and polishing the glass with polishing room. The plate glass, having now been ground and polished until the surface is smooth and faultless on both sides, is freed from the conveyor and, strong and transparent, is carried off by a pneumatic grab ready for service. Day and night, Mile after mile of glass, over 100 inches wide from just one production line. Commercial glass is manufactured in vast quantities in Great Britain for many different purposes. Glass for scientific research. Glass essential for electrical and chemical uses, for acid line taps. Glass wool and glass cloth for all types of insulation. Bulletproof shields for fighter planes lamp covers and lamp bulbs, all glass hypodermic syringes and tubes for the manufacture of synthetic fabrics and so on. Glass technicians have evolved machinery to reproduce the art of the craftsman, as in the drawing of glass tubing, or again, as in the making of glass bricks, where the blob of molten glass is cut off, pressed in a mold at great heat, then cooled rapidly under an air jet. While still pliable, it is taken for a final trim, and then the two halves of a brick are hermetically sealed together, producing a translucent glass brick with excellent properties for insulating heat and sun. Glass bricks, a significant highlight on the architecture of the future. Machines mold glass and machines blow glass. And sometimes they do both imitating exactly the movements of the craftsman. And in early type machines, even the length of the punties, which swing and spin on these machines, making electric bulbs and radio bulbs. progresses, the punties are shortened and are increased in number so that four gathers of glass are made at one time, 
mechanical power and man's inventive genius have produced these amazing machines. Machines also make bottles of many sizes and varied shapes. One remarkable thing in these particular machines is that the pot containing the molten glass is constantly revolved, keeping a steady supply of glass for the rapidly moving punties to gather. The gathering mechanism picks up the required quantity of molten glass, then while the mold empties the bottles previously made, the gathering mechanism opens up, revealing an elongated glass bubble. Up comes the empty mold and then closes the glass bubble and the process goes on. This film, which demonstrates the important position that Britain holds in the production of glass, was photographed through a perfectly balanced British lens of a type famous throughout the world. Through it, we see the means to supply so many needs of war, means which we will turn to meet the needs of peace and progress. So Britain makes glass. Glass to invite the sunlight into her home, into her factories, and into her school. Looking through glass, we see a brighter future. During manufacture from the raw materials, glass becomes molten and flows like syrup, getting stiffer continuously as it cools. Upon these facts depend the whole practice of the craftsman and technician in glassmaking. In the case of the craftsman, the making of glass demonstrates what a wonderful thing the human hand can be, flexible, strong, and extremely sensitive. The air bubble is the foundation on which most of the craftsman's work is based. Although machinery plays a big part these days, the craftsman, using his simple traditional tools, is still indispensable for the manufacture of special orders, too small perhaps to warrant the setting up of expensive machinery.
The craftsman is also the source of most of the beautiful in glass. Beauty in glass is best expressed in lovely forms. However, simplicity in decoration can add considerably to its charm. The great beauty of glass is its translucence and color. Decoration can be obtained by cutting, etching, sandblasting, and by the mixing of these methods. The craftsman can change quickly from one task to another, requiring only his few tools and a wealth of experience. The white section of this lump of molten glass must be in exactly the right place, as it is to be the opaque backing in the hundred feet of thermometer tubing these men will draw by hand. And the small air bubble must also be in the right position, as it becomes the passage in the thermometer. When the mass of molten glass is placed on the post, or rod, the join is made firm by cooling it rapidly with cold water. As the tubing is drawn out, it is revolved on the instructions of the craftsman. This revolving is necessary to prevent the weight of the tube causing the lump to sag out of the tube. The longer the tube gets, the more often they have to turn it over. It's really quite simple. Just a lump of molten glass, an iron tube, an iron rod, and about 10 years training. Here is another side of the industry which does not change, the craft of the pot maker. The pots made of a special clay have to be able to stand a furnace heat of 1500 degrees centigrade. The body of the pot must be uniform and well knitted and the inner surface perfectly smooth. Any irregularity would eventually break off under the drag of the glass and spoil it. The mixture of sand, soda and lime from which plate glass is made is heated in furnaces to a tremendous temperature until the raw materials in the pots slowly fuse and become ready to pour. It seems incredible that these clay pots brought to a white heat can hold safely well over a ton of molten glass while being transported and